Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting talk in our GPCR webinar series. So we're going to get started now. Today's webinar is from chemistry to clinic, discovery of biased epilin receptor agonists and action in the cardiovascular system, presented by Dr. Anthony Davenport, who is the head of human receptor research group at the University of Cambridge, UK. On behalf of DiscoverX, I would like to thank you all for attending this webinar. I'm your moderator, Alpna Prasad, product manager for GPCR assays at DiscoverX. Before we begin our presentation, I would like to remind you that this webinar is designed to be interactive, and you can submit your questions by typing them in the Q&A box on your screen. All questions will be answered in the Q&A session at the end of the talk. The presentation slides and the recording of today's webinar will be available on Discovery's website, and the link will be emailed to you tomorrow. Next slide, please. Before we get started with the presentation, I would like to take a couple of minutes to give a quick overview of Discovery Solutions for drug discovery and development from target IDE to post-launch for some of the folks in the audience who may be new to DiscoverX. DiscoverX is the leader in cell-based assays. These assays are available as both off-the-shelf products and as part of screening and profiling services. The portfolio covers several druggable target classes including GPCRs, kinases, interleukins, checkpoint receptors, etc. And you can choose your target from over 900 pharmacologically relevant functional assays. With over 15 years of experience and over 1,700 publications across multiple applications, these solutions deliver reliable data to support and drive any drug discovery program. Next slide, please. As you know, GPCRs represent the largest class of validated therapeutic targets with over 30% of currently marketed drugs targeting these receptors. Discoverex offers the largest portfolio that includes over 650 functional assays covering more than 90% of this receptor class. The assays are available with cyclic AMP, calcium, beta arrestin, and internalization as functional readouts that can be run in a single or a multiplexed mode. These naturally coupled receptor cell lines have been tested and validated with their known ligands to ensure superior performance right out of the vial. The assays are available as stable clonal cell lines or complete ready-to-use kits optimized for both small molecules and biologics. These assays are also offered as a part of our GPCR screening and profiling services. You can also choose to create your own assays in any dividing mammalian cells using our toolbox products. These include vectors, retroviruses, and parental cells with beta arrestin internalization and trafficking as functional readouts to analyze GPCR variants, orthologs, etc. With that brief overview, I would like to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Anthony Davenport. Next slide, please. We are very excited to host Dr. Anthony Davenport as our speaker today. Dr. Davenport is the reader in cardiovascular pharmacology and directs the Human Receptor Research Group in Experimental Medicine and Immunopharmacology at the University of Cambridge, UK. His research concentrates on understanding the role of G-protein coupled receptors together with their transmitters in the human cardiovascular system and how these are altered with disease state. A major focus for over two decades has been on endothelin peptides and more recently on the epilin signaling pathway and biased agonism. In addition to his research work at Cambridge, he is also an executive member of the IUPHAR and the group leader for the orphan GPCRs. In today's webinar, Dr. Davenport will discuss strategies for exploiting orphan GPCRs recently paired with endogenous ligands as illustrated by epilin and Elabella or toddler. He will also describe pharmacologically relevant cell-based assays that were used to identify functionally selective agonists as potential drug candidates. Without further ado, I would like to invite our speaker, Dr. Davenport. Thank you. I'd like to thank Alpana for that introduction and also welcome everybody to this webinar. I'd like to start by thanking members of my research group who are shown here 
together with my long-standing collaborators, particularly Robert Glenn, who's in the Department of Chemistry, and also like to thank uh, ongoing help from Dr. Andrew Green and colleagues at DiscoverX for developing these assays. I'd also recommend, if anybody wants to uh, find out more about G protein couple receptors, as well as many other drug targets, this particular database, which is the International Union Pharmacology database, which can be accessed uh, using this website address. So as you've heard, I'm going to talk about our strategy for translating orphan G, pro G protein couple receptors recently paired with their cognate ligands into the clinic. So I'm going to illustrate this uh, using the role of apelin, a peptide. And this is a potent vasodilator. Uh, in other words, it increases the flow of blood through blood vessels, as well as a positive inotropic agent, which means it increases the force of contraction in the heart. And this peptide is downregulated in a particular disease called pulmonary arterial hypertension. And then going on to describe how we use DiscoverX assays in order to identify biased agonists and describe our first in human proof of principle studies using a G protein bias cyclic peptide, which we've called MMO7, and how this attenuates pulmonary arterial hypertension in an animal model. Then going on to describe how we are using the assays in order to identify small molecules to see whether or not uh, the apelin uh, receptor can be targeted by uh, these sorts of compounds which are not peptides. A major limitation of all peptides, of course, is that they're not orally bioavailable. But I think in order to be a credible uh, candidate, we need to be able to identify small uh, compounds which can be used as a once a day drug. And then finally, I'm going to describe uh, the results we recently obtained on the expression and function of a second new apelin receptor ligand, which is called Elabella or toddler, in the main and cardiovascular system. This is particularly intriguing as it was originally identified from the so-called non-coding region of the fish genome, and it's evident that it's also expressed in humans and has particular effects in the mammalian cardiovascular system. So the genes which encode the G protein couple receptors are probably one of the most numerous as a family in the human genome. We're particularly interested, as you've heard, in class A G protein couple receptors, where there's about 242, which bind established transmitters such as angiotensin. And we also have a class uh, A GPCRs about 30, where we have a single pairing, but we don't yet have enough information to confirm whether the endogenous ligand is turning out to be uh, the true ligand or not. In addition, we also have 57 so-called orphan G protein couple receptors, where we don't yet know the transmitter, and the function is awaiting discovery. But during the last um, two decades, pharmaceutical companies as well as academic groups have made considerable progress in deorphanizing GPCRs. About 60 have been deorphanized so far, and about half of these have turned out to be peptides, including apelin. So this slide summarizes on the right-hand side the uh, receptors which have now been liganded with uh, particular peptides which are shown on the left. And those in blue are ones in which there is an ongoing or registered clinical trial. It's indicating the dynamic um, work which is going on in this area. So I'm going to focus on apelin. This was originally um, uh, identified as a result of a reverse pharmacology screen using um, the gene encoding the APJ receptor, which was originally designated an orphan. This was identified by O'Dowd and colleagues, and it remained an orphan for about five years until Tatamoto was able to show that a new peptide, which he called Aplin 36, that had been identified from the bovine stomach was able to activate the G protein couple receptor uh, when expressed in cell systems. He called this peptide apelin for APJ endogenous ligand. And the prototypic peptide is apelin 36. But it's clear there are a number of points where smaller peptides could be obtained. And before we embarked on a drug discovery program, we thought it important to identify the peptide that was most abundant. 
And this turned out to be pyroinapolin-13, which has this pyroglutamate postrandulational modification. And this is used as a reference in all the assays that we carried out. So in a collaboration with uh, Robert Glenn in the Department of Chemistry, um, a, a, mod uh, a model was designed of the apolin receptor, which is shown on the right-hand side. You can see in the MOVE seven transmembrane spanning domains within the plasma membrane. And this is interacting with a space-filling mole molecule, uh, which is the apolin peptide. And from this molecule, we were able to uh, determine that there's an initial binding with the C terminus. And we and others have shown that these residues are particularly important for binding. And then interacting with the binding pocket, particularly at the end terminus, with again, this sequence RPRL being particularly uh, significant. So this is the main uh, physiological role of apolin in the human cardiovascular system. So in isolated human tissues, apolin is an arterial vasodilator. And in this cartoon below, we can see an endothelial cell, uh, which is lining every blood vessel in the body, from which apolin is being continuously released. And it interac interacts with receptors which are present on the endothelial cells in order to release uh, vasodilators, such as prostacycline and nitric oxide. So infusion of apolin into volunteers or into patients, particularly those with heart failure, results in a beneficial vasodilatation. So in addition, there are also receptors present on cardiomyocytes of the heart. And in isolated human heart tissue, which is shown on the right-hand side, which is obtained from transplant patients undergoing uh, cardiac surgery, uh, with ethical approval and informed consent, we were able to show that it was the most potent inotropic agent that had been discovered. In other words, it was increasing the force of contraction of the heart. And this is also the case when infused into uh, heart failure patients in vivo. This slide summarizes the pathophysiological role of apolin in pulmonary arterial hypertension. This is a devastating condition with very poor prognosis, and it's characterized by uh, enlargement of vessels within the lungs, which then results in an increase in pressure as a result of constriction. This, in turn, causes the uh, right ventricle to hypertrophy, and this is the ultimate cause of death. So the current clinical strategy is to try and restore the balance between constrictor agents such as endothelin using endothelin receptor antagonists in order to promote vasodilatation. But none of the compounds which are currently used have any action on the, uh, any action on the heart. We know that apolin, but not its receptor, is downregulated in human and animal models of PAH. So our working uh, hypothesis is that we believe that we need uh, a first-in-class apolin agonist in order to activate the apolin receptors where the right ventricle is failing in order to, to replace the missing peptide and to produce a beneficial vasodilatation and an increase in cardiac output. Currently, no apolin agonists have been developed for clinical use. The potential limitation of many, if not most, GPCR agonists is that they can desensitize the receptors by recruiting beta arrestin and leading to internalization and downregulation of the uh, pathway. And as a result, the apolin signaling is switched off. In order to overcome this, we've identified the first apolin receptor agonist, which is biased to the G protein pathway, MMO7. And we've used this compound to explore the potential of biased agonists in uh, the clinic, as well as its disease-modifying properties in models, animal models of PAH. So this slide just summarizes the therapeutic strategy. So as I've mentioned, we thought originally that all agonists would equally activate the G-protein signaling pathway, as well as the beta arrestin. But it's now clear that we're able to uh, selectively activate one pathway, for example, G proteins in the case of apolin, with a reduced activation of beta restin, which will then result in reduced internalization and ultimately may lead to the development of new classes of drugs. We also know from the work of Skimmer and colleagues that if we remove apolin, as occurs in heart failure, 
the apalin receptor becomes a stretch receptor and this uh, potentiates the pathophysiological effect on the heart. So using molecular dynamic simulation, we embarked on a strategy in which we carried out an extensive cyclization program based on this uh, sequence in the uh, C terminus of apalin as well as the RPRL sequence um, of the N terminus. And in our hands, these had no effect on inhibition of apalin binding, whereas as you can see here, this particular sequence, RPRL, was tractable to cyclization, and we were able to inhibit binding of iodinated apalin. If you increased or decreased the number of amino acids, this resulted in no inhibition, and this led to the identification of MMO7, which is a cyclic analog, as you can see here, of apalin. So the strategy, once the compounds were generated, were to quantify bias. In the G-protein assay, we actually used an isolated human saphenous vein, which again is obtained from, uh, as a byproduct of, of surgery. And in this case, although I've told you that apalin, when infused into people and animals, results in vasodilatation, in this case, when the endothelium is removed, saphenous vein contracts to apalin. Although I should emphasize that this is a property which we use in a bioassay and is not representative of the main physiological effect of apalin. The second assay that we use is the Discovery Cyclic AMP assay, and then these two independent uh, assays, beta arrestin and internalization. Having identified the candidates, we then uh, took these into uh, humans for first in human proof of principle studies, as well as into uh, animal models. So this just summarizes the type of data from these uh, four assays. And in the top panel, we can see uh, cyclic AMP. Um, the apalin receptor is linked to inhibition of cyclic AMP. So we use forskolin to stimulate production and then measure the ability of apalin and apalin analogs to inhibit this formation. In the lower panel, which we'll see more in a moment, is a concentration response curve to, to apalin and MMO7 um, in the saphenous vein. And on the right-hand side, we see G-protein independent singling, in this case, uh, increased in beta restin recruitment or internalization of the receptor in apalin, again shown in blue, and then competing other agents shown in uh, other colors. So we've endeavored to try and minimize variation between these different assays. So as I've mentioned before, we always include a reference agonist, um, which is pi one apalin 13 in each plate. We know there's no differences in pH across the uh, various media for all three assays, and there's no background expression of apalin in CHO cells. I think very importantly, with many expressed cell lines, these are present at very high densities, probably 100 to 1,000 fold higher than in native tissues. And that can give misleading results as a result of uh, activation of compounds which don't have particular activity. So we've carried out experiments and been able to show that there is very similar density of receptors in the Discover excesses compared to human tissue. And this is just shown on this slide where we can see saturation binding assays with a specific binding of radio-labeled apalin on the vertical axis. As, uh, sorry, this is the specific binding on the vertical axis versus the increase in uh, radio-labeled apalin on the horizontal. And if we look at the maximum density of receptors, we can see that for the CHO cells and also for left ventricle, lung, and so on, these are in a similar uh, order of magnitude. We're also concerned that bias agonism might be the result of some change in kinetic properties of the uh, ligand receptor interaction. And we were carrying out our saphenous vein assays within about 20 minutes, whereas with beta restin on the other assays, we tend to have an exposure time for the assay of about 90 minutes. So we simply tested whether uh, apalin versus MMO7 would retain bias if we were to alter the time carrying out, in this case, the beta restin assays. And as you can see, over 20, 30, 45, and 90 minutes, which is shown here, the same bias factor was uh, retained. So it's, it's unlikely that the bias that we see is a result of kinetic differences. 
So this is the data uh, that we used in order to uh, take forward MMO7. So in the panel on the left, we can see the concentration response curve to increasing concentration of um, the two peptides which are employed to an isolated saphenous vein. And you can see that both peptides have got a similar potency. But this is in marked contrast when we look at the two DiscoverX assays, where in the case of beta estin and internalization, there's a rightward shift with MMO7, and you can see about two orders of magnitude difference in the potencies of these compounds. So what do these look like in the clinic? So the technique that we use is, uh, for, is um, venous occlusion plesismography, and you can see on the left-hand side that these two cuffs are periodically inflated as a strain gauge around the arm in order to measure blood flow, and then peptides are introduced. So this is a concentration response curve with increasing amounts of apelin shown on the horizontal axis and um, forearm blood flow on the vertical. So apelin is expected causes this increase in forearm blood flow, which is consistent with a dilator. And as you can see here, we reach a maximum somewhere around 10 nanomoles per minute of infusion. So in contrast, although MMO7 is less potent, you can see the magnitude of the response once you get to higher concentrations is much greater. This is what we would expect from a biased agonist. Similarly, in the human forearm, we can infuse a dose of apelin, wash it out, and then show that we still see uh, a response with no evidence for desensitization of the receptors. And then thirdly, in this case, uh, using echocardiography to measure cardiac output, which is shown on the vertical axis uh, versus the horizontal axis, which is shown uh, here. Um, we've got the two peptides again with um, pyronapin 13 shown in blue and MMO7 shown in green. And as you can see, there's a concentration dependent increase as we would expect in cardiac output and the magnitude of this was much greater, significantly greater, with PI1 up in 13. So we next tested whether or not uh, the biased agonist would have efficacy in an experimental model of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So we use monocrotoline, which is a plant alkaloid, with a single injection. This uh, reproduces many of the pathophysiological uh, changes uh, that occur in human pulmonary arterial hypertension. So in this protocol, a single dose is given and then vehicle for 21 days. <clears throat> we also give MMO7 uh, on a daily basis at this concentration, MMO7 on its own, and then the control vehicle. And at the end of these experiments, um, we carry out magnetic resonance imaging as well as histological analysis. So this is probably the most important data, which is the so-called Fulton index, where the increase in the right ventricle is measured as the uh, ratio of right ventricle wet weight divided by the left ventricle plus septum. So as we would expect, compared with the control, the right ventric ventricle has undergone hypertrophy as a result of the increase in pressure within the lungs. MMO7 on its own has no effect, whereas uh, daily infusions of MMO7 uh, with monocrotoline injections is able to attenuate uh, the development of this disease. These are longitudinal sections of magnetic resonance images of uh, rat heart. And C here is the blood, which is shown in white, and then we can see the chambers of the heart in um, uh, darker colors. So if I play the movie, we can see that this is normal blood flow through the heart. In marked contrast, you may be able to see that the right ventricle is enlarged in the monocrotoline-treated animal. And then there's this characteristic kick to the intraventricular septum, as well as this discordant flow, which is what you see in humans. So if you now compare it with the MMO7 treated animal, you can see that we've attenuated uh, these um, particular properties. So our next question is whether we can retain bias within a small molecule. 
strategy that we've adopted was to synthesize and screen a series of compounds which are based on structures originating from high throughput screens carried out by Sanofi and Sanford Burnham and produced in patents. We were unsuccessful in obtaining any good data using compounds generated from Sanford Burnham, but what you can see here is four compounds from the Sanofi patent. As you can see, um, this is um, an experiment where we test compounds for the binding of I-125 apelin to clinically relevant tissue, which in this case is homogenates of human heart. All of these compounds have got reasonable affinity compared with pi one apelin shown in blue. And then we can see the results for the Discover X cyclic AMP and beta restin assays. And I think you can start seeing that there are differences emerging in this group of compounds. So if we focus particularly on CMF019, this has got a considerable difference between the uh, compound in the cyclic AMP assay, which is in the picomolar range, versus beta restin, which is in the subnanomolar, giving about 2,000-fold difference between cyclic AMP and beta restin. And we can calculate bias using the technique of Arthur Christophilus and colleagues, which is described in this paper using PRISM. When we compare um, beta restin and internalization, there's a very modest bias. Um, in the case of um, comparing beta restin, however, with cyclic AMP, there's about 400-fold selectivity for cyclic AMP over beta restin and about 6,000-fold uh, over the internalization. We next tested whether this compound would be effective in a, an animal model. So in this particular uh, experiment, a catheter has been passed into the ventricle of the heart in order to measure cardiac contractility. Saline is then infused followed by increasing concentrations of uh, either CMF019 and a, an increasing um, concentration of the molecule and interspersed with the saline control. And as you can see, there's a significant increase in contractility in a dose-dependent way. So this is again consistent with what we would expect, that uh, this compound is able to mimic the action of apelin at the cardiac apelin receptor. So this just summarizes the uh, results of this uh, part of the uh, presentation. Uh, MMO7 functions as a biased agonist in vitro, but is more effective in vivo than apelin in increasing cardiac output and vasodilatation. So we believe that biased agonists may have a therapeutic advantage in the treatment of conditions such as pulmonary arterial hypertension. Our CMF compound demonstrates that small molecule agonists can mimic the action of cyclic peptide analogues in displaying G-protein bias. And therefore, this suggests that the apelin receptor, like some others, such as the opiates and also angiotensin, are tractable to fine-tuning of multiple downstream signaling pathways. So in the last part of this webinar, I'm going to talk about the expression function of a new apelin receptor ligand called Elabella or toddler in the mammalian cardiovascular system. So for a long time, the apelin field was puzzled by the apelin receptor knockout mouse. So when you knock out the peptide, the heart developed normally. This was in considerable contrast to when the receptor was knocked out, when the mice were not born in Medinian ratio, with many of them dying of cardiovascular defects. So this immediately suggested that there should be potentially a second peptide. So the only known mutation that's been reported is one in the zebrafish, a mutant called Grinch. And as many of you will know, zebrafish are widely used in uh, development studies because they're transparent. So in this mutation, which results in this tryptophan 90 to leucine substitution in the second transmembrane domain, which is shown here, apelin does, does, does not bind. And in the fish, uh, it, the, the heart fails to develop. This is a particularly unusual mutation. There isn't really anything on the databases to date which has a similar phenotype. So very recently, two groups independently, uh, Chung and colleagues and Poli and colleagues, identified a new peptide, one group calling it Elabella, the second toddler. 
which when it was deleted reproduced the phenotype of the apelin receptor knockout. In other words, in many of the uh, fish, the heart failed to develop. And they suggested that the, this peptide was acting at the apelin receptor. So again, combining the data from these two papers, this suggested, at least in fish, there might be three distinct peptides, again, because of these uh, different uh, dibasic cleavage sites. So the largest is LR32, which is stabilized by a disulfide bridge, LR21, and uh, LR11, where the disulfide bridge is now removed. There's no particular sequence similarity in terms of amino acids when you compared with aplin 13, although there's some degree of sequence similarity when you plot the hydropervicity of the amino acids. So molecular dynamic simulations indicated that uh, LR11 was able to dock into the model that we have of the aplin receptor, and this is shown here with a space filling model of LR toddler 11. This is the cysteine residue here, and then this is the proline down here, docked within the binding site. We're also able to map, as shown in colors here, that the seven of 11 amino acids of this peptide that were interacting or predicted to interact with amino acids within the target receptor. And interesting, only two of these appear to be shared with apelin. So our aims was to determine whether error is expressed in the human cardiovascular system, and secondly, to determine the physiological role, and if it's particularly altered in uh, pathophysiological conditions, such as pH, PAH, uh, as apelin is altered. So the usual assays were carried out. In this case, this is uh, the testing the ability of these compounds to compete for the binding of radio-labeled apelin in clinically relevant human left ventricle. So again, you can see uh, the results for pi one apelin 13 LR32 and 21 are very similar in terms of potency and affinity. What we can see here is that we're getting to lose affinity with LR11. We next tested uh, these compounds in the internalization assays from DiscoverX. So this is cyclic AMP, and I think you can see that they're all behaving very similarly, and the data shows that they are uh, acting uh, with the same um, degree of potency. And then on the right-hand side, we can start to see some differences emerging, with in particular LR21 being, sorry, LR11 being less effective, which is shown in green. And this might suggest that there may be uh, endogenous bias agonists with the, within the Elabella toddler signaling pathway. We next wanted to confirm that uh, these peptides were binding to the apelin receptor. And we used, in this case, this is shown with LR32. This is a, a, a concentration response curve in the beta arrestin assays. And in both cases, these are blocked either by uh, a non-peptide antagonist, ML221, or by our peptide antagonist, MM54. And this produces a rightward shift or a flattening of the curve in both cases. And then for comparison, we can see the effect of ML221 on apelin. We next measured the amount of messenger RNA uh, present in human blood vessels. And these are ones that we are able to obtain from surgery. So this is coronary artery, mammary, radial, and pulmonary artery, aorta, umbilical, and saphenous veins. And remarkably, we can see quite a high expression of messenger RNA within the uh, arterial circulation compared to the uh, venous, suggesting that there may be a differential response or expression within uh, these particular vascular beds. We can also see in a uh, cross-section of human lung by immunocytochemistry the localization of LR immune reactivity to the single layer of the endothelium, where there's a very little staining elsewhere. And on the two panels here, we can see LR staining uh, localized to the blood vessel wall. This is von Willebrand factor, which is a marker of endothelial cells. So when we combine these two images, we can see overlay between LR and the von Willebrand factor marker of endothelial cells. So we don't see localization in any other tissue. We've also uh, examined the distribution in uh, isolated endothelial cells. 
This shows that the small secretory vesicles, which places Ella within the so-called constitutive pathway, which is one of two pathways synthesizing peptides within the endothelium. This is also the pathway where we've localized apolin. So surprisingly, and fortunately, we didn't detect any um, ELA within the uh, so-called regulated pathway because there was no co-localization with the vivar and bodies. This might have indicated that the two peptides would have a distinct uh, way in which one would be um, uh, released as a result of external stimulus compared to the apolin, which is within the constitutive pathway. But the evidence suggests that both peptides are being continuously released. This slide shows uh, a transverse section, again through a rat heart, with the uh, blood shown here. And in this case, LR32 has been injected. So this is pre-injection, and then this is 10 minutes after injection. And at the bottom, the still images um, show the um, diameter of the ventricle uh, following injection of LR. And you can see very quickly the volume at the end uh, uh, is considerably reduced, indicating that the peptide is producing an increase in cardiac output, so also acting as an inotropic agent, very much like apolin. And we can see similar results shown here for comparison. And then the quantitative data uh, shown on this slide with both uh, compounds producing an increase in uh, ejection fraction. It was important to know whether Ella was also downregulated as apolin, as this was our working hypothesis as to why we need uh, a biased agonist for the treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So again, this is a panel of confocal images where we have Ella immunoactivity activity in normal lung tissue, von Willebrand factor, and this is the overlay. And you may be able to see um, that there is some reduction in the amount of immunoreactive staining. And when we look at the right-hand side panel, we can see that the number of endothelial cells which are positive for ELA is reduced compared to um, normal lungs. So this suggests that peptide is also downregulated in PAH as well as apolin. We also confirmed that ELA, like apolin and MMO7, is able to attenuate the development of um, pulmonary arterial hypertension uh, again, in the monocrotaline rat. So this is the uh, control versus the MCT, where we have the increase in right ventricular hypertrophy, no effect of ELA itself, but a, and again, an attenuation, significant attenuation, when we inject on a daily basis with ELA. So this is uh, my final slide. So ELA toddler is expressed in the human adult cardiovascular system with remarkable high levels of messenger RA present in the arterial walls. We've been able to localize the ELA peptide to the secretory pathway within endothelial cells. The levels are quite low in human plasma. And this suggests that the peptide, like apolin, is also locally released in an autocrine paracrine manner in order to interact with endothelial cell receptors as well as those on the cardiomyocytes. All three LR isoforms are able to activate apolin receptors, and they're blocked by our current receptor apolin receptor antagonists. Importantly, Alabella toddler is downregulated like apolin in PAH. I think of particular interest is that um, what this study shows is that regions of the human genome, which are currently classified as non coding, may be the source of further novel peptides. So these may turn out to be the ligands for the remaining 57. G protein coupled receptors. So I'd like to thank everybody for listening to this webinar, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Davenport, for the presentation. Um, I would like to remind our attendees today that if you have any questions for our speaker, please submit them in the Q&A box on your screen. So let's look at a few questions that we have. Uh, what progress is being made to exploit biased agonism in the clinic? Um, so the main um, 
I'll just go to look yeah. So the so the main areas that have been developed so far are in targeting the mu opiate receptor. This has been a particularly interesting target because uh, as many people will know, um, this is activated um, by opiates such as uh, heroin. Um, the major disadvantage is that we can't really use heroin routinely as a pain-killing um, molecule because there's a development of um, addiction as well as depression of the respiratory system. So the company uh, Trevena have developed this compound called TRV130, which is a mu opiate receptor biased agonist. And this is now in phase three trials for pain relief. And this particular compound, which is shown here, is also designed to activate the G protein uh, pathway to produce the beneficial analgesia, but at the same time have much reduced effects on uh, the unwanted respiratory depression and also the unwanted effects of uh, GI dysfunction such as constipation. So this is probably our best example of proof of principle moving into the clinic. Thank you, Dr. Danford. Um, the next question is, how can orphan receptors be studied using discovery assays if we don't know the endogenous ligand? So um, I think the um, one of the uh, interesting uh, strategies for many of the so-called orphan G protein couple receptors is that we know that they are or potentially could be important as disease. This is based partly that they come up in genome-wide association studies as well as knocking out the uh, receptor results in a particular phenotype in, in mice. So what, yes, so this is one of the uh, interesting ways in which um, these can be studied if you do find uh, an orphan G protein couple receptor is that there are a number of so-called um, surrogate ligands. And uh, here I've just uh, uh, listed some of these uh, which are present in this uh, guide to pharmacology. Um, so there's about 20 of the 57 um, orphan G protein couple receptors where it has been reported in high throughput screens as well as assays like those of DiscoverX, compounds will have agonist activity. So in this particular case, this is a drug, so it's not a naturally occurring molecule called uh, Zaprinast. And this was identified by uh, this group um, when they're carrying out a high throughput screen using the DiscoverX uh, system of beta arrestin assays. And what they identified was that they could actually activate um, the uh, GPR uh, receptor. And this one um, was able to be show we were, this activity that you can identify in uh, the human uh, apelin receptor. And also there is activity in mouse and also in the rat receptor. So this compound, if you found uh, an example where you wanted to try and explore what these, uh, this particular GPR35 was doing, then you could uh, use these compounds as surrogates in order to uh, map uh, particular effects of this compound and see what it might be uh, doing to either an animal model or to a cell-based system. Thank you. Um, the next question I have is, how robust and sensitive are these assays? Um, so w w we would recommend that, um, they, well, they can be very sensitive. And we use, uh, to, to, to make sure that they are sensitive, we, we recommend using a dedicated um, a plate reader, which simply measures light. Uh, we found that using um, some of the more complicated spectrophotometers, which will also carry out light measurements, tend to have a lot of filters in place, which tends to attenuate the signal. I think you can see from our slides that the sensitivities of these assays, we can start to see effects of apelin at 10 to minus 12, 10 to minus 11 range. So that's a very good sensitive system. And we also find them to be um, very reproducible. In other words, they are cell-based assays. Um, so that's why we always have a reference standard in there. But they are reproducible from one uh, batch to another. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, 
So the question we have here is, the recommendation is usually to use a reference agonist on each plate or assay. What is the best one to choose? So I think this is still um, the subject of a lot of discussion by people carrying out um, assays in order to identify biased agonism. But I think probably it still is logical to choose the most representative endogenous agonist um, because you're normally trying, at least in a drug discovery um, program, to identify compounds which have a greater degree of bias than the naturally occurring compound. So that would be my recommendation. But I think the important thing is if you have a robust uh, standard is to um, decide what you're going to use right at the beginning and then keep with that because you will generate a large amount of data and it's very useful to always have a reference compound to make sure that if you do find unexpected results you can check uh, to see whether the assay was behaving as expected. Alpana, would you like to tie this up? Oh, um, thanks, Stacey. Uh, thank you, Dr. Devonport, for your excellent presentation and your um, responses to the questions. Uh, that's all the, the time we have for today. And uh, we would like to remind you, uh, the slide presentations and the link for this webinar will be sent to you uh, shortly via email. Uh, we would like to thank you all for joining our webinar today. Have a great day. Thank you.